Chapter 1. Where Your Fear Begins Colin McAdam, internationally acclaimed novelist Colin McAdam has a PhD from Cambridge University and is an internationally acclaimed novelist. He has written for Harper's, Granta, Salon and Hazlitt, among other journals, and his books have won or been shortlisted for several prizes, including the Amazon Best First Novel Award, the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, the Giller, GG's, and the Rogers Writers' Trust Fiction Prize. His most recent novel is Black Dove, a story about genetic editing and the adventures of a grieving father and son. The following chapter is being read by the author Colin McAdam. My business is telling stories. I think all the time about the role of them in our lives, how much we need stories, how our need for them distinguishes us from other apes, yet serves an ape function of protecting our groups. Stories in the form of scripture, shared collections of tales that we can unite around or use to exclude others. Fairy tales we can tell to prepare our children for their journeys in the woods. Stories can warn us, scare us, light up the darkness, chase away boredom and they can also make us brave. I think the word narrative has never been more commonly used than it has over the past three years. Sometimes a substitute for spin, always a synonym of story. To some, the story of COVID goes like this. A virus of zoonotic origin jumped species and was spread in a wet market in Wuhan. It burned indiscriminately through populations in Iran and Italy and carried on throughout the world. It is dangerous for old and young, causes long-term disabilities, and even though it is airborne, it can be contained by locking down populations for certain periods of time and is mitigated if everyone wears a mask, gets vaccinated multiple times, and stays six feet apart in well-ventilated spaces, if not apart completely. To others... The story starts with a lab in Wuhan, with gain-of-function research conducted either to develop bioweapons or vaccines or to help understand theoretical pandemics. The virus's furin cleavage site and genome reveal it is man-made. It probably began spreading long before we realized. It is harmful only to the very ill and the very old is not contracted by everyone, even within small settings, and is, for the most part, experienced as a cold or flu. And, like the flu, the vaccines given for it, which are mostly not vaccines but experimental gene therapies, are often not effective in reducing transmission or severity, and are sometimes dangerous themselves. One of these stories is told by the mainstream media, and the other has largely been censored. The first brings benefits to pharmaceutical companies in terms of selling vaccines and medications. It benefits technology providers, Zoom, Microsoft, telecommunications companies, anything that facilitates work from home or remote learning and online shopping. It benefits those who like controlling information, the media and politicians in power. And it benefits those who own the media and politicians pharmaceutical companies and technology providers, among others. It is also an appealing story to those who believe their government will look after them, that strangers are foolish and to be kept at arm's length, that it's easier to take medication than to be healthy, and that those who make the medication could not possibly be so evil as to create a virus and market its cure. Of the two COVID narratives, the second is based on fear of those in power and the first on fear of each other. Even though we were meant to be all in this together, to lock down and take our lumps, the purpose of that story, certainly its consequence, was to keep us apart. As that story came to dominate, we were kept from friends, from restaurants, from bars, movies, live music, gyms, stores, parks, beaches, and playgrounds. We were told we might be sick without knowing it, that everyone was a vector of disease. We hid each other's faces and made children think they would kill their grandmothers by going to school. 
I was not inclined to like that story. I didn't really want to hear it. If every day is a gift, given that we are mortal, should we really postpone its enjoyment? Can we presume we will have more days? If I love people, if people need love, how long should we be apart? Two weeks, a month, the school year, the summer. Wait for the winter to pass. Do it for the healthcare system. Do it for the teachers, the frontline workers. It's not hard to wear a mask. Everything can be bought or done online. I've tried to remember all of the absurdities, tragedies, and indignities that I witnessed or went through over those early years of COVID, but it occurs to me that none of it was unique to me. To listen to the remainder of this essay and the 33 other essays, please visit Audible, Apple Books, or Amazon to receive your copy in print, ebook, or audio. Thank you.